Now, if you have followed Senator Booker, which many of you have, including people in our Equal Justice Working Group working on juvenile justice, people in our Climate Change Working Group, our Animal Welfare Working Group, all of our working groups are following you, basically, um, you'll know that he's known for bringing an innovative and bipartisan approach to tackling some of the most difficult problems facing New Jersey, our country, and the world. So thank you for coming here to share that innovation with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, should, should we practice our, our State of the Union look? Yes. yes. <laughs> or, or, do we bring, or do we bring guitars we out? We could do the guitars. You know? That's true. I, I needed that song. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, we should have had a little caucus last night after the speech. <laughs> Senator, thank you so much for making the time. I know you have a hard stop and you pressed us in because. This guy's getting married in a matter of days. <laughs> yes. 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 Thank you, I appreciate That's that. That's very exciting. It is, it yes. is. Um, it's been a long journey, as all things are. And, 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 um, and now we, when, you, when you're present with love, then you embrace it. Kind of yes. like Jonah set us up to start this whole session. We embrace the fellowship of the abundance of love that we all have here. And that's the spirit of mentorship. Yes. Uh, and, and we've known each other personally, professionally, for nearly a couple of decades now. And, and uh, everything that you know of Senator Booker online, on social, on TV, is all true. And it exudes the love and the passion, the abundance of spirit that you've always had. Now the platform is not only national, it's international. All eyes are on us and what we're doing in this moment in time. Why does mentoring still matter to you in the face of the bigness of the moment? I, I, I'm a, I've come to believe that a lot of times we see these big problems in the world and we allow our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something. And what I found in, in, in my own personal journey that uh, almost always the biggest thing you can do in any day is a small act of kindness, decency, and love. And what we tend to underestimate is the power, the resonant power of one action, one intervention, one relationship, uh, and what that can do. And I know this very intimately because um, I remember sitting in Chicago once when we had this record year of violence reduction in Newark, and uh, uh, it was just a, 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 a tremendous thing. So I used to get the question when I go to other cities, well, how do you uh, drive down violent crime? And I would go, look, you could do it with more law enforcement, more armaments, more that kind of stuff. Or I could tell you how we could do it right now. We could go to Chicago schools and find, interview every teacher and tell her, the, ask her the fourth grade students you're worried about and pair them with mentors and you would see a crash in, in juvenile crime overnight. And, and, and the data holds that up. And, and the reality is, is we don't have a problem in this country that, in terms of our ability to solve problems. It's not about a matter of can we, it's do we have the collective will. Mm -hmm. And it often starts with individuals uh, uh, and the decisions we make on a daily basis. And I know that I'm here, I can, I can trace it. I am here because of small actions, because of people who didn't think I'm gonna solve the world's problems, but I'm just gonna do the best I can with what I have where I am. And, the one example I've been talking about a lot about that is, I mean, when I became a senator, uh, my dad died six days uh, before I was elected in the special election. So I, my mom and I came to the Senate uh, really uh, brokenhearted, but yet at the same time, um, uh, here I am being sworn in. And my mom smartly took me to go see John Lewis right beforehand. And if you know uh, John Lewis, if you've had the privilege of meeting him, He's this towering giant in American history, but he's incredibly humble. Like, that's the first thing you realize, this humility of spirit that he has. And my mom was just having a good time, and he was telling me what a privilege it is uh, to be able to sit with me and see me be sworn in as the fourth popularly elected black person in the history of our Senate. But I, I um, but, but, but here, he's saying this with all this humility, and his office looks like a civil rights museum, except for he's in every picture. <laughs> um, uh, um, and, um, and so I, I go to the, to the Senate floor, get sworn in, and I, a year later I decided to write a book, and I had to figure out, go back and research the stories I've been told as a child. And my dad is this guy who, before he would die, he said he worries. Uh, he really anguished in a bad day in Newark. Uh, he anguished to me that a kid born just like him, uh, poor, black, in a segregated environment to a single mom, which is how the majority of kids in Newark are born, the majority of kids in most cities um, are born. And he said, I worry that, that a kid born like me would be better off being born in 1936 when my dad was born than being born today. Mm. And I'm a data guy, and I, I always, when I was married, so I was saying, God, we trust, but everybody else bring me data. 
Um, <laughs> and, and when I looked at the numbers, unfortunately, if you look at the outcomes for an African-American boy, uh, on a lot of indices, he's absolutely right. It's better for him to be born in 1936. And the stories of how my dad broke cycles of poverty all had to do about individuals, like mentoring relationships, when his mom couldn't take care of him, that snapped it. Or individuals, when he got to college, people who were not leading the civil rights movement, but street-level civil rights workers who made decisions with their summer that they would come out and do sit-in movements. When he got to Washington, D.C. here, it was just not these names you read about in newspapers, but ordinary Americans who came together and started lobbying companies to hire qualified blacks. My dad gets it's the first African-American hired by IBM as a salesman in the entire Virginia area, this area. And then when my parents move up to New Jersey, they, white, uh, white real estate agents wouldn't show them homes in communities that had great schools, which happened to be white communities. Every time they'd show up, they'd be told the house was sold. And so a volunteer white couple on their weekends, set up by these lawyers, uh, this incredible lawyer who led this organization and the Fair Housing Council leader, they, my parents would go see a house, they would be told it was sold, the white couple would find it still for sale. And the white couple put a bid on one of these houses for my parents as a proxy, the bid was accepted, papers drawn up, and on the day of the closing, the white couple didn't show up, my dad did and another volunteer lawyer named Marty Friedman. Now, I tell you all this because when my dad walks into the real estate agent's office, the real estate agent uh, gets confronted by the lawyer, doesn't give up, he punches the lawyer in the face, <laughs> sigs a dog on my dad, yeah. And, um, and I always say that every time my dad would tell the story, the dog would get bigger um, <laughs> growing up. It's like, boy, I bought a pack of wolves to get you in this community. <laughs> and, and so I grew up just like feeling this sense of my dad was hardworking, my parents self-reliant, self-discipline, all this stuff, but they would always tell me about all these individuals mm -hmm. that intervened in our lives to get us to where we are. And the end of the story, the reason I want to make this point about all of us right now, today, thinking about what we could do is that when I decide to write a book, I'm now a senator, and I, I, and I have to fact check everything. Was it a dog or was it a pack of wolves? You know, I have to make sure <laughs> before I put this in, in, in a book. And I find out, Carlos, that, um, that it was easy to start tracking down these players from the story because the head of the Fair Housing Council from the 1960s, she's still head of the Fair Housing Council today. Her name is Lee Porter, she's 92 years old. Now she's not representing black families. Now she's representing same-sex couples and Muslim families. Wow. And then I asked her to, for the lawyers, one of them died, the guy that took a punch for my family, which is, is a shame. Every one of us here could think right now of somebody they should say thank you to, a coach, a mentor, somebody in your lives that we probably haven't thanked enough. Uh, probably be so excited to hear from you. It would be one of the great gifts you could give tonight mm -hmm. by doing that to somebody. But she said, find this guy named Arthur Lesman who organized all the lawyers. And this gets back to this current moment. And I, I, I find this guy, that track this guy down, he's 84 years old, he's a retired judge now, and uh, glad I talked to him because he would die a couple years later. And I just profusely thanked him, confirmed the facts of the story, wasn't a pack of wolves. Um, <laughs> but then I finally asked him why. Why would you, as this white man in the 1960s, who's just starting a business, everybody here who's done a startup knows how all-consuming that is. Why would you take some part-time to help black families move, integrate your community. And he said, well, one day I was sitting comfortably at home, comfortably at home, and um, I, I, I'm watching TV and this news story breaks in where they, these marchers trying to get from Selma to Montgomery, and they get stopped on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and beaten back with billy clubs, heads smashed open, uh, uh, and, and I was so horrified by what I saw that I said, I, I, I gotta go to Alabama. I went to work the next day, then Monday, told my partner we gotta go to Alabama. He says, he laughed at me, we couldn't even afford a plane ticket, we were just doing a startup. And we sat there and in essence he said, he concluded that we're not gonna solve the crisis in civil rights in America, but we can do the best we can with what we have where we are. And they called around, they found Ms. Lee Porter, they started representing black families. A couple years later, they get a file with my parents' name on it. And so the, 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 what I wanna draw to you for a second here is, what, what is this chain reaction called love that most of us don't get? It's an energy, like the stars we see at night in the sky, uh, that those stars themselves have died millions of light years ago, because that's how long the light takes to get to us. Their stars are actually dead, but we see them as if they're there because the energy, the light, the warmth goes on in perpetuity. And so here's some people on a bridge, this guy named John Lewis and a bunch of other marchers that on one day, they didn't even reach their goals, they fail, but their righteousness of standing up unleashed this light and this love that a thousand miles away had jumped 
jump this geography to change somebody's heart in New Jersey, who would then go on and change the destiny of generations yet unborn. That's the power of love. And, and these one-on-one -on -one relationships, right. they may seem small in the moment, but what you're doing is you're changing destinies, you're transforming outcomes, you yourself are emanating light that might make somebody else be a mentor then changes history there. Alice Walker said the most common way we give up our power is not realizing we have it in the first place. Amen. We are so profoundly powerful as people, but often we fail in so many instances to use that power. And so I'm a United States Senator. I was a mayor of a city. I, all of us have been busy. I, I, will, I will compete, especially when I was mayor. Senators, we get like recess again and all this stuff. <laughs> but when I was a mayor, I was as busy as hell. But I still took time to mentor kids in Newark. And now I have, I have my mentee, Keandre, who's now uh, 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 graduating from high school. But I've like, I adopt kids in my neighborhood because Alice Walker, and I'll end with this and maybe let you ask a question. Um, I, was, I, 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 told, I told Rachel early on, I have the easiest job to make. Ask one uh, question and inspire us all. But Alice Walker, <laughs> she's got this great book called In Search of My Mother's Garden, if you ever have a chance. There's a chapter in it called, uh, uh, I think, Black Revolutionaries. The real revolutionary is always concerned with the least glamorous stuff, with raising a child's reading level from third grade to fourth, with filling out food stamp forms uh, for people because they have to eat revolution or not. The real revolutionary is always close enough to the people to be there for them when they're needed. I've made a decision with my life. I, I graduated from law school and I'm, I said I'm going to move into a low income uh, uh, inner city community. I'm the only senator that lives in a neighborhood with a median income is $14,000 uh, per household. I have a community that is rich with culture, rich with spirit, but uh, you know, I had a shooting on my block recently. My community struggles with lots of issues, but I want to stay physically close. One of the sins in this world is how separate we are from each other. And maybe you don't have to live in a community that's in struggle, where, where millions, tens of millions of Americans live every day, where they're worried about their safety, they're worried about the quality of their public school. Maybe you don't have to live there, but, but we should be mentoring, we should be connecting ourselves spiritually to there, because nothing will change about this world unless we are willing to be a part of that change, even if it's the smallest uh, uh, thing. Amen to that. So, thank you. So I was grateful to have this moment because we realize a fight for social justice is a marathon race. And sometimes even the best marathon runners um, get, need the, the glass of water to fuel it and replenish their body. Marathon race run at a sprinter's pace. When we're on the ground, we sometimes see, we don't see the forest from the trees. Can you, you provided a spark for us in Newark about a decade ago when you restarted our organization and we came in and, and we now have magnified the mentoring movement in Newark with yes. partners Incredible. alike. But it was with your spark. And as we've grown this and have had thousands of mentors step up in the lives of children in places like Newark, knowing firm, firmly that demographics does not determine destiny. If you pour into a child's life for an hour a week, it's a simple thing, and we all can do this. But yet, throughout that journey, we confronted many, many naysayers, many people who didn't feel that they could make the time. How do you find that time even still? Throughout the journey that you were talking about earlier, writing books, <laughs> uh, speaking, speaking truth to power, and also having a national platform. How do you still make the time? How can we all make the time to pour into those most proximate to us? Well, I'm gonna say something big and then something small, and I'm afraid of being belled again, so I'll try to go quick. <laughs> Look, I mean, the big thing is all of us in this room, whether you're a millennial or an ex gener if you're in one of those two generations, we have a comeuppance, we really do. Um, we're, we're on track to be the first generation of Americans not to do better than our parents. We are a, a, the first generation that has taken this inheritance, where if you look, I'm a data guy, so if you look at the World Economic Forum, it keeps data on the success of nations, the, the competitiveness of nations. On every indice in our parents' generation, we were at the top, or grandparents' generation. Now in our generation, things have been crumbling downward. We had the best education systems, the best social mobility. If you were gonna be born on the planet Earth poor, this was the country to do it. No longer the case if, it, if you're just measuring somebody who can get out of poverty into the middle class. Um, we used to have the best infrastructure on the planet Earth. We literally took our parents' beautiful, spectacular house, trashed it, and we're about to pass on to our children $3 trillion worth of infrastructure debt. I can go on and on and on. 
But the indices that matter to me more than any have to do with child poverty, yeah. um, have to do with, with the outcome of children, what's gonna happen with kids. Uh, um, the great Maasai warriors have a greeting when they meet each other as Kasira and Gira. Uh, um, uh, it's a question, their greeting is a question, how are the children? And on those measures, our generation also has a cub umpins. And I can go on to more of the data of why I'm worried about what our legacy will be. The, the generations that have not been called the storm beaches in Normandy, the generations who have not had to uh, endure a great, a great depression that literally threatened the fabric of Western democracies, a generation that has not had to do freedom rides or march for suffrage, uh, for suffrage or, or battle for uh, uh, civil rights. Our generation who luxuriates in, in all the blessings of this democracy won for us by others, the question will be what will we do in our generation? How will we be remembered? And it can't just be technological achievements because what's technology when you still have per persistent poverty in communities? What is technology when you still have 3,000 communities where children are being poisoned at twice the blood lead levels in Flint, Michigan? I could go on and on and on. What is the use of being technologically advanced when that is the condition? And so the question I'll simply say to end is the, this, this idea that we have to wait for senators or a president to be a part of that change is just wrong. Everything comes down to what am I doing right now? And I want to say, and Carlos is a man of such integrity, um, where his words so well match up with, his, with what he does, and that what you were asking that question is this idea of spark. And, and that's really what I want to end. Every moment of our life, every moment we have one choice to make over and over and over again. It's to accept things as they are or take responsibility for changing them. Um, every moment of our life, something is small. I got a direct message on my Instagram today from one of the red jacket wearing uh, 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 guys when, when in the Capitol, when people come to visit the Capitol, just going out of the way saying it means so much that when you're briskly walking, you stop and talk, you say hello. We underestimate the power of one small act. And I'll end with this confession. Look, um, I, I live, as I told you, in an inner city community, and unfortunately, ubiquitous in inner city communities uh, are these things that are a weakness to me. Um, they're like sirens, and, and, and when I imagine myself in my haughty moments as like Odysseus going home, they're like sirens calling me to the rocks. I don't know if you've ever heard of these things, but they exist a lot in Newark. They're called McDonald's. And, um, <laughs> and I'm a vegan, and how do you know somebody's a vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and so this is an example. I'm driving home one night um, t towards my house, three blocks away, and it's calling me. And I just tell uh, my guy, he's a, you know, Kevin Batts, he's a yeah. Newark guy, grew up in the projects, went off, served in the military, came right back, joined the police. He's been in the police department for his entire career. He, he was all my security details. I'm married, joined my mayor's staff, this Detective Batts. He's driving me in the car. I'm sitting in the back of this SUV, and I'm like, yo, Kev, man. Kevin Week, man, we gotta go, we gotta go. And he, so he goes in, and of course I don't go into McDonald's because I'm a vegan, I don't wanna be seen in there. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna go the drive-through. And so I slide down in my seat like this, my hat pulled down, I disguise my voice, I'd like to have, um, please, two large fries. And, and, and I go around and, I, and, they, and they hand me these fries through the drive-through. And these things, um, they, they, they literally, like, I just put some legislation in to deschedule marijuana, make it legal on the federal level. I think we should, but I think we should schedule McDonald's French fries because they're so addictive. And they put, them, they put them through, and I'm holding these things, the ambrosia, it's just amazing. I'm like, I'm in the Lord of the Rings. I'm like, my precious. And, 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 and so now we start to drive away, but then I see a guy at the end of the drive-thru, in a trash can, with uh, head first, trying to, rooting around. So I said, Kevin, hold up for a second. I roll down the window, I say, hey man, are you okay? And he waves me off, and I go, hey man, listen, hey, you all right, do you need anything? And he turns around and he says, um, I'm hungry. Now, the problem is, is, as a guy who, and I really do believe, before you tell me about your religion, show it to me and how you treat other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's something in the Bible about if you have two McDonald's French fries and your neighbor has none. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, so it I'm just, it was just, it's a painful moment for me. So I'm like, ugh, I know what I gotta do. And so I say, sir, come, come on over. And I reach in and now my hand suddenly starts shaking involuntarily because I'm about to give away my fries. And I hand them out the window and he tries to pry them away, but my hand, 
instinctually locks around the far end. But he eventually pries him away. He looks happy. I feel some sense of satisfaction that I've lived by my values. Um, and, and then Kevin uh, is about to start going again, but then he looks at me and, and in a painful look, he just says, hey man, do you have any socks? And I knew immediately what was going on uh, for somebody that was living on the streets. And I, I looked at him and sort of at a loss. And I'm like, I'm, I don't carry extra socks in my car. And I look at him and I say, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have any socks. And just at that moment, I see Kevin put the car in park, reach between his legs, pull off his socks, and hand his socks out the window. And so here I am preaching about love and kindness, but here was a guy that was showing me that every moment of your life, if you inject it with a spirit of moral imagination, if you inject it with love, if you're fully present and bring your creativeness mm. to every situation, you can make a difference that will last forever. One action from Kevin Batts, and here I am on a stage talking to a couple hundred people, sharing that story. So my, my, my request to everybody here, it doesn't have to be be a mentor, but if you do a mentor, you will change a life, and you'll also change the life of the mentee because uh, your own life will change. But, but, I, but find some things you could do, the small things you could do in your life, in, in your moments, and I promise you, as big as our problems in the world do, if we all do that collectively, we will transform this world. And in our generation, we may be able to, as King called upon the future, we may be able to be the generation in America where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, Cory Booker!